<laughs> Commissariat. Okay, thank you, Francis, and yeah, thank you for for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here um, after two years and a half. And actually, yeah, this was supposed to happen two years ago, <laughs> but I guess everyone knows what happened. And uh, okay, it's two years later, but I'm here, so I'm happy to to be able to give this talk. And. Uh, yeah, actually, what I will try to do is try to give an overview of uh, spin qubits, like a uh, really broad overview and explain how they work and how we operate them and what do we want to do with them. And uh, I hope uh, you can all follow, but if at any point you have any uh, doubt about any slide I'm presenting, please interrupt me. I mean, I don't care. I prefer that you understand everything. So interrupt me at that point, and we can discuss a bit more in detail that, pro that, that problem you may have. Um, so yeah, I'm a PhD student at CA Grenoble. CA, it's Commissariat der Energie Atomique, but no one does atomic energy anymore <laughs> at, at CA. So now there is a lot of people doing quantum information and quantum computing. Grenoble is a pretty nice city. It's the capital of the Alps, and we are surrounded by quite nice mountains, but there is also a lot of science going on there. Actually, this area you can see here, all of this is the scientific area of the city, which is quite big. And actually, there is a lot of interest in quantum computing in Grenoble, and in particular in quantum computing based on silicon spin qubits, and this is what I will talk about today. So there is this big project that is called Quantum Spin that involves many partners in Grenoble. But I would say the special thing about Grenoble and quantum computing there is that everyone is in place. So in an area of one kilometer squared, everyone working on quantum computing in this project is there. So we are the CA, and yeah, it's pretty big. So we are like 5,000 people working in, in this center in Grenoble. Not so, not so many in, in quantum computing because there are other topics. In quantum computing, at CA, we have the people from CA Leti that works on the fabrication of the devices. So these are the guys that are fabricating the quantum computers based on spins. And then there are two teams that work on the characterization of these devices and to do the real experiments, the real quantum computing experiments, which are the people from CNRS and the people from IRIC, which is a group from, from the CA. And in between all these experimentalists, there is a small group, which is us, LSTEAM, the theoreticians, and uh, we work both for the people doing fabrication, people from Leti, and people doing characterization. So yeah, it's quite, uh, quite nice because we interact uh, with all the stages of the quantum computing, both optimizing the, the design of the devices itself and also understanding the, the physics of these devices when they do characterization experimentally. Actually, we are quite a lot of people in total working on, in this uh, quantum silicon project. We are more than 50 people working in this. And probably the reason why there is so many people is, why, is because there is a lot of funding. So <laughs> you know here in Spain now there is this quantum Spain project that tries to boost the quantum technologies in Spain. More or less in parallel in time, uh, we had the same in, in, in France. But actually if you compare the orders of magnitude of the money that is spent in France and in Spain, yeah, it, it, it's there's quite a difference, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, I mean, this is all the politics of, of my talk today. So let's move to, to science. And what's on the menu today? So as I said, uh, I would like to explain a bit how this um, uh, spin qubits work. So first, I will give a brief overview of the topic, and then we'll focus on spin qubits, and we'll see how do they look like, how do we operate them, and then how we can we build a large-scale quantum computer out of this, of this technology. At the end, if I have time, that I'm not very optimistic, I will talk briefly about how do we simulate these devices. So let's start. So yeah, I, I actually I started in this topic a long time ago, but not, not so long ago, like two years and a half ago. And I came from surface science, so it's quite different. 
And normally when you want to know more about the topic you don't know about, what you do is you go to Google, right? And you type quantum computing. And actually, if you do this, it's quite funny because the two first entrances are, okay, quantum computing will never work. And the second one is quantum computing will change the world. <laughs> so, but okay, it's funny, but it's true. It's, it's a debate that we have in the, in the community right now. And this field is in a so early stage that it's not even clear if it will change the world or it will never work. Okay, so with this, I want to emphasize that we are in a so early stage that this is not even clear. If quantum computing will change the world or it will never work. And then there are so funny things. If you're a crypto guy, be careful because it may kill Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, a bit of history about um, quantum computing. So I, I, I have here a timeline of more or less the more important, uh, the most important events on the quantum computing uh, field. And what I want to emphasize again is that it is a quite new field. Actually, the first superconducting qubit, which is the most advanced platform so far, is from 1999. So yeah, not so, not so long ago. And actually, the first qubit based on the on the platform we are used at we are using at the CA is from 2016. So we don't have a lot of experiments uh, on this platform yet. So the field is really really new. Now, uh, the qubit. Uh, in order to explain what a qubit is. I think the easiest way to understand it is to compare it with a classical bit, right? So classical bit, everyone knows, a transistor, we have a two-level system, we have q and it's, uh, it's one, we don't have q and it's zero. So in this sense, quantum computing is digital because it can take two values, either zero and one, and with this, we can encode information. Now, if we go to the quantum bit or the qubit, it is also a two-level system, but in this case, it's a quantum two-level system. So we can also take the values of zero or one that we can encode in these two level systems of the quantum state. But it can all, not only take these values, but any superposition of these two states. Because it is a quantum system, we can have quantum superposition. So the way we can represent this is in what we call the block sphere. And a quantum state can take the value of one, which can, would be the state pointing down, the value of zero, which would be the state pointing up but also any superposition of these two states that can be represented on any point on this block sphere. Since these coefficients are, can be uh, complex, it is not a, a circle, but it is a sphere, so it has th three dimensions. In this sense, we have to notice that quantum computing, in this case, is analog, it's not digital, because we don't have two discrete levels that can either take the value of zero or one, but our states can take infinite values in between zero or one. So in this, in this sense, quantum computing is analog. And it can bring some problems. And now I will try to illustrate briefly which kind of problems uh, this can bring. So imagine that we start with an initial state zero, and then we apply an operation to our state, any operation, but in this case, we can consider that it is a full rotation over the block sphere and we end up at the same place. So with a very stupid rotation, but <laughs> okay. We do this rotation just for illustration purposes. And this may not be perfect because since this is analog, it may happen that we don't stop exactly at zero, but a bit tilted on the left or on the right. So this is, we can have a small error, let's say a 1% error, okay? If we do it only once, we do this rotation, we go from zero to zero, but since we have this small error, we may not end up exactly at zero, but we may have a little bit of one, because we are a little bit tilted in this sphere. Now, if this is only one operation, it's fine. This, can, this will be small. And then when we measure, we will have most probably zero, and everything will be fine. But now what happens if instead of doing one operation, we do many, many, many operations? At the end, this randomizes your, your final result, because at the end, this error will start to pile up one on top of the other. And at the end, you end up with a mix of zero and one that does not make any sense. So. This is a problem associated with uh, analog computing, and the more operations you, ha you do in an analog computer, the, the more errors you will have. And this is something we have to deal with in quantum computing. Now, it also has some advantages, of course. If not, I mean, it would be nonsense to do it. <laughs> and probably the most paradigmatic one is quantum parallelism. So, as we said, we can entangle uh, the quantum state and form entangled states. And this allows us to explore a larger Hilbert space w when we work with qubits than when we work with classical bits. Because with n qubits, we can entangle two to the n. We have two to the n basis states. If we are able to entangle all of them, 
if we work with bits, we either have bit 1 in 0, 1, bit 2 in 0 over 1, and this is for n qubits, n states. In qubits, we have 2 to the power of n, so we have a larger Hilbert space. But not, also, not only this, but when we apply to a quantum state an operation m, let's imagine the same operation m done before, when we apply it to an entangled state, in fact, what we are doing is applying it to each and every one of the individual states. So this is why it's called quantum parallelism, because you do your operation once, and it is applied to all the basic states forming your quantum state. So this is super nice, because if you have a large number of qubits, you entangle all of them, you apply once the operation, and then it's applied to all your states. It would be wonderful if we could have the results directly from here. But it is not that easy, because we know that if we have a mixed state, like 0 and 1, when we measure, we will either have a 0 or a 1. So at the end, you cannot get these guys individually from a single measure, because when you measure, you will project your states, and you will get either 0 or 1. So at the end, OK, this makes a little bit more complex to extract this data. And actually, what this makes is that when you do a quantum computation, you have to make sure, your algorithm has to make sure that your final state is a pure state. So when you measure, you don't have a probability, a certain probability to, to get different states. But when you measure, you get one state, which is the pure state of the system. And this is what you get. Um, OK, so I guess everything's clear. and, and now we know what a qubit is. Now we may wonder, OK, what is the physical platform we use um, to, to, to encode these qubits? So a physicist would say, any quantum two-level system. OK, which ones? Here I would, I, I, I would add any, any quantum two-level system. And I would add an harmonic, uh, in the sense that, OK, for now, we have said, OK, we have two, le two, two energy levels. We put 0 on 1. If we are able to drive this transition, we can turn from 0 to 1, and we can encode the information, right? But the, quanta, the physical systems, they have excited states as well, right? And these excited states, we need them to have different energies than the ground state, because otherwise, if they have the same energy, if, you, if we bring this energy to the system, we will drive the transition from 0 to 1, but also from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, and so on. So at the end, we need distinct energies between the first excited state and the second, the second and the third, the third and the fourth, in order to be able to address only the two states we want to call the information. So there are many candidates, uh, many quantum two-level systems to form a qubit. And actually, here I list, uh, I, I think I list all of them. I will just briefly talk about superconducting qubits. And then we'll, fo uh, we'll focus on electron spin qubits, because these are the ones we, we study at the CA. Superconducting qubits, super briefly. I will talk about them because they are the most advanced platform uh, we have so far. And we have big companies like Google, IBM, Microsoft, and yeah, this is a Chinese group, um, investing on this, on this technology. And probably because these companies are putting a lot of money is why this is the most advanced platform so far. But they also have some, um, some disadvantages. So. They have short lifetimes. At the end, quantum information is fragile, and we will enter into this uh, later on in more detail. But now you have to, to trust me. In, in superconducting qubits, we lose the quantum information pretty fast. And this is a limitation for them. And the other limitation is that they are big. So as you can see, this is every qubit is more or less in the millimeter, in the millimeter range, two millimeters. And if you want to go to millions of qubits, this makes your chip uh, quite big. Um, and actually, the largest quantum processor on Earth, at this point, it has only 127 qubits. It is make, made of superconducting qubits by IBM, and it has 127 qubits. So <laughs> you know now, in the classical computers, we have millions on, of mil and millions of bits. And the largest superconducting quantum processor at this point has 127. So this also illustrates in which early stage we are in, in, in this field. So yeah, this is a picture of an experiment to really see how a superconducting exper a qubit experiment looks like. So yeah, this is 33 qubits. So imagine putting a million of qubits in a setup like this. I mean, it's unfeasible, right? Now we move to electronic spin qubits. And OK, here we have quite a few partners. I would say the main partners are the main um, 
universities and research centers and working on this. And uh, yeah, the idea behind the electronic spin qubit is to encode the quantum information on the spin degree of freedom of an electron. And you know, right, in molecules, if we have an orbital state, we can put uh, two, two electrons in it with different spins, spin up and spin down, and we fill the orbitals in molecules or uh, in this way, right? Now, if we apply a magnetic field, these levels will split, and at the end, we'll have a difference in energy between the spin down and spin up state. Now, if we can only populate one of these states, and we can drive this zero to one transition, the spin up to spin down transition, then we can encode information on this, right? So this is the idea on the electron spin qubit. Now, you have to realize on the energy, the energy scales of this, of this system are extremely small. This is on the 40 micro EV range. So this is extremely small. If we compare this to KBT, KB in microelectron volts is 86. So we have to have a temperature well below one Kelvin. Otherwise, we just terminally populate both states and at the end went with a mix that it makes no sense. We cannot do anything with this, right? So this is why if we work with electronic spin qubits, it's similar for superconducting qubits, but we need to work at cryogenic temperatures in the millikelvin range. So these experiments are in huge fridges that are in the millikelvin temperatures. Actually, the largest quantum processor based on spins has only six qubits. <laughs> so we are far, far, the superconducting qubits are way more advanced than, than us uh, at this point. But still, uh, in classical computing, something similar happened, right? Because the first classical computers were made of vacuum tubes. And these were huge classical, uh, these classical computers were huge and they occupied rooms and they were super heavy. And at some point, lucky enough, someone said, okay, what if we try transistors? And now we have millions of transistors in millimeters squared. So somehow we hope that spin qubits can be to superconducting qubits what transistors were to <laughs> the vacuum tubes. But yeah, it's too early to say, but we will see. Uh, okay, so let's take a closer look to semiconductor spin qubits. And let's see how do they look like. In fact, they look more or less like a transistor. The idea behind the spin qubits we use at the CEA is they look more or less as, uh, like a transistor. In fact, a transistor is a semiconductor channel with a gate on top, right? And then with this gate, we control whether we have current or not, and we can open or close the channel. And this is zero, one. This is a transistor, right? Now, if we put this exact same device at very low temperature, at some point, we don't see this anymore, but we start to see some peaks. And these peaks, in fact, what they are is that we are seeing the electrons one by one that are going through the device. And this, okay, was realized experimentally um, long ago. Well, in this field, 2006 is long ago. And, uh, okay, so we can count the electrons that go through. Now, if we can trap one electron below this gate, in fact, we have a single electron with a single spin that we can use to encode this information. And uh, if this would be a single qubit, now we say, okay, we build a transistor, but now we put two gates. This would be two qubits. And then we say, okay, we made this bigger, and then we put face-to-face -face gates, and then we can create an array of qubits. So this is the idea behind these semiconductor spin qubits and how they are supposed to, to grow up. Uh, in terms of sizes, transistors are small and we know it from, from classical computing. So this is now in the micrometer range. So this is much smaller than superconducting qubits. And actually at the CEA, we made this uh, in an industrial fabrication lab, which gives us this, we, well, experimentally, they receive these kind of buffers that have millions of millions of devices like this inside. And then you dice a small, a small piece of this buffer, you put it on a fridge, that is a millikelvin temperature, and you do your experiments. Okay, so how, does, how do these uh, spin qubits work? Okay, for a, what, the properties we need for a qubit, in order to be a qubit, is to be able to do these three main stages. The first one, we need to initialize the system. The second one is we need to manipulate it and do the quantum calculation. And finally, we need to be able to read out the state, the, the, state, the final state, and get the result from the calculation. So now we will review uh, these three steps in a spin qubit quantum processor. First one, the initialization is quite simple, because as I said at the beginning, we have this semiconductor, uh, this semiconductor channel with a gate on top. And actually what I didn't say is that we have here two areas. 
that are highly dot, they can be positively dot or negatively dot. And OK, this is a detail, but this will determine which charges do we trap here, because we can trap electrons or we can trap holes, which is the antiparticle of the electrons. It's the absence of an electron, but we can do spin qubits with this as well. But anyway, this is not, not so important. We will refer to electrons from now on. So we have here an excess of electrons or holes, and we have a gate on top. Now, if we do nothing with this gate, the potential landscape of this semiconductor channel looks like this. We have a barrier right here on the gate. But since we have this gate, we can tune this barrier. And then we can bring this barrier down, down, down by applying an attractive potential in this gate to the point that we form a potential well. Now, since we have a pool of electrons here on the sides that have Fermi energy or whatever it is, when this well is below the Fermi energy, electrons will jump in, right? Now, this will form a quantum dot. This is what we call a quantum dot. And it's an electron density below the gate. Now, at zero magnetic field, we'll start to pair electrons on, on the orbitals. But as I said, if we apply a non-zero magnetic field, and now, if we are clever enough to tune the potential in this gate to have the spin up level above the Fermi energy and the spin down level below the Fermi energy, we only populate the spin down, and we have an unpaired electron. Yeah, is this clear? Good. So, so this is how we prepare our two, two our quantum two-level system, our qubit, right? Now, we need to manipulate this. And uh, yeah, this is a bit tricky. Because basically, because spins, intrinsically, they only couple to magnetic fields. So if you want to manipulate uh, this system, if you want to coherently drive uh, oscillations between the spin zero, uh, the zero and one state, the spin down and spin up state, you have to bring this delta energy but in a, in a magnetic field, because spins couple to magnetic fields. Now, technologically, to bring a magne an oscillatory magnetic field of this form to the system is a bit tricky. So what we would like to do, in fact, we have a gate on top. If we make several qubits, we will have several gates. So if we want to deliver, we want to rotate only one qubit, we want to deliver this energy to a single qubit, what we would like to do is to do it electrically, because we have this gate. We can send an oscillatory electric field to this gate, and this will uh, what we would like to do is that this rotates the spin. Now, what we do when, when we apply this uh, electric field on the gate, the oscillatory electric field on the gate, in fact, what it does is it shakes a bit the quantum dot that we have below. So at the end, the electric fields eff eff uh, affect the quantum dot, the, the motion of the quantum, the position of the quantum dot, and the shape of the quantum dot, but not the spin. The spin, in principle, is insensitive to this. But okay, I said in principle because, in fact, there is a relativistic effect, which is spin orbit coupling, that I will not enter in detail into this. But in fact, as the name as the name says, it couples the spin to the orbit, right? So if we shake the orbit, and we have spin orbit coupling, it will affect the spin. So at the end, if we have this mechanism, it will allow us to drive electrically our spins. We have this for holes, but we don't have this for electrons. So here we split holes electrons. If we have holes. We apply an electric, uh, oscillatory electric field on the gate, and we can do rotations with the spins. If we have electrons, we have to play a, a small trick here, which I, I, I find this trick quite funny and quite, yeah, quite interesting. In fact, what experimentalists do in this case is, OK, we want an oscillatory magnetic field. We move the, the dot when we apply the electric field. What can we do? OK, we put a micromagnet on top. This creates a gradient of magnetic field. And then, if we move the dot in this gradient, at the end, this is an oscillatory magnetic field, right? So <laughs> it, we call this uh, uh, we call this an um, yes uh, extrinsic spin orbit coupling in some sense because it's not intrinsic to the electron, but it's a micromagnet that we put this that at the end couples the orbit effect to to the spin. Uh, anyway, bottom line here is we have a way to manipulate electrically the spins, right? So we can deliver this oscillatory electric field to the gate, and we can rotate the spins. So we can do one qubit manipulation. But now this is not enough to encode uh, uh, quantum algorithms, because you, you know in classical, in classical, uh, in classical um, algorithms, we have two-bit two logic gates. So we need two-qubit logic gates. How do we do these two-qubit logic gates? 
Okay, yes, I forgot. So at the end, when you when you drive this system, at the end, this is in a coherent way that you have oscillations like this, and then you start at zero, and you pass by a combination of zero and one, then you have one, and then you go to zero again, and depending on where you stop, you can do full rotation, half rotation, or whatever you want to do. So this is for the one qubit manipulation. Now, for the two qubit gates. How do we do two qubit gates? And to emulate the classical uh, logic gates uh, in these kind of systems. So now imagine that we have two qubits, right? With two different energies, they, they might be different, in a system like this, where we form the two qubits with the two gates on top. We want to, as an example, we will focus on the CNOT gate, which is the classical XOR gate. What this gate does at the end is just to say, if the qubit 1 is in state 1, so if the qubit 1 is spin up, I want to rotate the qubit 2, whichever the state is. So if it's 0, we rotate. If it's 1, we rotate as well. If the qubit 1 is in 0, I don't want to do anything. So this is a 2 qubit gate. And in fact, to understand how we do this uh, in spin qubits, we have to look at the energy diagram uh, of, the, of the 2 qubit system. OK, we said we have uh, two energies. So we have the excitation energy for the qubit 1, which is independent of the state of the qubit 2, in principle. So we have here in green this excitation energy, and here in green as well. And then in brown, we have the excitation energy of the qubit 2. Now, this is when the two qubits are uncoupled. But now, if we couple them, so they have a potential barrier in between that we can decrease. If we couple these two qubits, at the end, it's good because what happens to the energy is that it brings down the energy of the two middle states and it brings them, them down asymmetrically. So at the end, the symmetry we had on the excitations in the uncoupled case breaks. So at the end, this is fantastic because we have four excitation energies, one for each transition. And at the end, we can choose which one do we drive. So OK, we want to do this C0 gate. So at the end, we choose to rotate the qubit 2 if the qubit 1 is in 1. This is the brown one. So we go to our gates, we apply the radio frequency, and then if the state is in the 0, 0, nothing will happen because we are not driving this green transition. We are driving the brown one. But now, if we start from the, brown, from the 1, 0 state and we apply the transition, we will have the rotations. If we stop at the right time, we have our 2 qubit gate. OK? So this, this is an example of a two qubit gate. There are many. Um, but at the end, the, the way they are implemented is, is, is always similar. So it's a combination of turning on and off the interaction between the, the neighboring qubits and then driving a, a given energy in order to conditionally rotate the transition we, uh, the qubit we want. Yeah, it's clear, a two qubit gate. So yeah, I, I just showed, I, I, I just showed uh, one two qubit gate and a simple one qubit rotation. There are other operations, but all of them I, are always done like this. So it's always playing with the driving and playing with the interaction. Now, this, uh, with all these kind of gates, we can encode any quantum algorithm we want. So this is a complete basis to encode any quantum algorithm we want. And uh, at the end, every single uh, every single gate like this, it's an operation we do on our spins, and the kind of operations we do is what I just shown. So at the end, a quantum algorithm, like Shor's algorithm, it's probably one of the most famous algorithms because, okay, it allows the factorization of large integer numbers, and this is not possible to do in, in classical computing, and apparently it should be possible to, to do in a quantum computer with a, with, a, with a proper algorithm. So it looks like this. This is an example of a Shor's algorithm. And it's not that I understand everything here, because yeah, quant quantum algorithms are super complex, and yeah, these guys are super clever. <laughs> but the people working on this, I, I mean, I don't get anything. But uh, what I want to stress is that every small box like this, so this box we recognize because it's a C0 gate. So if you, are, if you are the guy working on the experiment, you start uh, reading this, and you, are, you arrive at this point, and you say, OK, C0 between the qubit 1 and 3. So what you do is what I just shown. 
you control the interaction, then you drive the given the the, the given excitation, and this is your C naught. And then, okay, this is done. You go to the next, another C naught. So you do the same with the other pair of qubits. So when you see diagrams like this, every line is a qubit, and every box like this is a small operation like the ones I just explained. And this is how the quantum algorithms are encoded in a, in a, in the hardware. Okay, what time is it? Oh, good. Now, imagine we've done the quantum calculation in the way I just explained, and now we need to read out the information. We need to extract the result from, from the system and bring it to the, to the classical world. And to read out spins, yeah, to read out spins is complex. I mean, yeah, it, it's a very delicate state, and to, to read out uh, spins is quite complex. And the way it is done, actually, is to say, okay, I have difficulties to read out spins, and apparently it is easy to read out charge for experimentalists. So they say, okay, we convert the spin signal into a charge signal, and then we see what happens with charge. And there are two ways to do this. The first one is Coulomb blockade, and the second one is parallel spin blockade. I will briefly talk about the two. In fact, Coulomb blockade is based in the same principle in which we initialize. Is at the end, we end up our calculation, and imagine that the qubit is in the state zero. So we bring the state zero and one in between the Fermi, the Fermi levels of the, of the reservoirs, the pools of electrons we have on the side. If we have the system in the state zero, uh, in the state zero, so we spin down, this is stable, nothing will happen. If we have the system in the spin up, the energy for this guy is higher than the reservoir, so it will just jump off, and it will leave the dot. And then we have here an empty, ener an empty energy level that is below the Fermi energy of the, of the reservoirs, so something will jump in, and we will end up with the same situation. But actually, this is not a spin signal, but a charge signal, because we have a charge that is leaving the quantum dot and another charge that is entering the quantum dot. And this can be sensed experimentally. So if it works, yes. So at the end, they can discriminate the spin state just by checking at the current through the device or the capacitance of the device or some experimental variables. And then if they don't see anything, it was spin down. If they see a blip, on the signal, it was spin up. So this is the way they convert a spin signal into a charge signal that they can detect. So this is based on a Coulomb blockade. Now, Pauli spin blockade. Um, the idea is similar, and at the end, it's based on Pauli spin on the Pauli spin blockade principle and Pauli exclusion principle. And the idea is to use a second quantum dot. So we have our qubit, and we put on the side a readout quantum dot that we initialize with a spin down and we leave it like this. And then we try to bring the electron on the, on the left, on the qubit, into the, the quantum dot on the right. We try just to move the electron from one side to the other. If the two are, of them are spin down, Pauli spin blockade don't allow to do this. So at the end, either if this system energetically is not stable, at the end Pauli spin blockade don't allow you to, to bring the two electrons together. So it will stay like this. If the situation with a qubit state is in spin up, then the electron will jump from this, from this quantum dot to the other quantum dot. And again, you can detect this charge signal. So this is another way to, to, to read out the state of your spin, also based on spin char to charge conversion. So overview of, of um, how this spin qubit work. Initialization, we place in between the Fermi energy the spin up, spin down state, we load only spin down. Manipulation. We have a way to manipulate electrically our spins. For electrons, we put micromagnets. For holes, we don't need them. Anyway, we can do it electrically. To read out, we convert the spin into a charge signal, and then we can read this uh, charge signal and discriminate between spin up and spin down. So this is more or less how do they operate. Now, OK. We've seen one, two qubits. <laughs> we need millions of qubits on a quantum processor. So how we go from this into millions of qubits? Actually, it's, com it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a complex issue. And uh, one, of the, one of the main problems of quantum computation and quantum computing is the loss of quantum information, as I hinted a bit at the beginning. 
And for this, we have two mechanisms that, uh, that makes us lose the quantum information. First one is qubit relaxation. So we have a two-level system, and we're encoding information in an excited state, which is the spin-up state, is excited state. We have ground state spin down, excited state spin up. Naturally, excited states tend to, to, tend to relax. At a, we call this uh, relaxation rate, uh, yes, the time associated to the relaxation rate, we call it T1. So at the end, if you place your electron at the, at the spin-up state and you wait, and then you measure the probability of getting the electron on spin-up uh, as a function of time, it exponentially decays because it is an excited state. At which speed? Um, for for uh, um, electron spin qubits, it is usually in the yeah in the best case scenario on the millisecond to second range. So this is a constraint because your quantum calculation has to end before this happens. So this is not you submit your job to your classical supercomputer. You wait 24 hours. You go after you have the result. Here your quantum calculation has to be faster than the second. <laughs> so, but but it's even worse because the second mechanism that is the coherence, and okay, it's a bit complex to explain, and I will just hint a bit how, how, how it works, but the idea is that it is a quantum state and it has a free evolution because of the um, time-dependent Schrodinger equation. If you have a quantum state, it will freely evolve according to, to, to this equation, right? Now, if you are on the poles, the poles are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of the system, so they will not evolve. But as soon as you go somewhere tilted from, from, from these poles, this will start to rotate just because of the free evolution of a quantum state. So at the end, that it rotates is not a problem. And actually, we use it uh, to, to perform qubit gates as well. The problem is that the speed of this rotation highly depends on the environment. And if you have small fluctuations of the environment, the speed of rotation will also change. And at the end, what happens is something like this. I hope it works. Yes. So. If you have many qubits, you do this operation, you put them in play, but at the end, since the environment changes, if you do it at certain uh, different points in time, they start to spread because the speed is different for each one, and at the end, you end up with something that is not even, that is not anymore yet what you wanted to have, but since it had spread at different speeds, you end up with a mix of everything, so you lose your quantum information as well. And the way we see it is because the Rabi oscillations tend to, the Rabi oscillations are the oscillations between the spin up and spin down state, tend to smooth, and at some point we don't see them anymore. So at the end, we don't know what we are rotating just because the states get mixed uh, because of this free evolution. And the time scales for this actually are on the microsecond range. So this is a harder constraint for your quantum processor. It needs to be faster than these decoherence processes, and they are on the hundreds of microsecond range in the best case. So your quantum calculation must be faster than 100 of microseconds. So this is quite fast, right? OK. So we have errors, and we have to deal with them. Now, if we have a single qubit, we cannot do much. But if we go to hundreds of qubits, thousands of qubits, we can think on ways to try to correct these errors, right? And these are the quantum error correction codes. So. At the end, if we want a quantum computer that is reliable, we want it to be fault tolerant, that it does not have errors. The quantum computer itself, the, qubit, the individual qubits may have errors, but we want the quantum computer not to have errors. And at the end, if we do single operation on a qubit, imagine we, do, we have a qubit on the state spin up, we do an operation, we read out the result, we get spin down. And then you wonder, OK, is this spin down because the result of the calculation is really spin down? Or is it spin down because it has relaxed? Because it can relax, right? So naively, we, we, we could think, OK, let's do, let's do one thing. Let's take five qubits, and we do five times the same. OK? So we do five times the operation, and we measure five times the result. And now we do majority vote, and we say, OK, I had four times 0, 1 times 1. For some reason here, I, had an, I assume I had an error. This is one because something happened in between. And the correct result is zero. So uh, yeah, th this, yeah th this would be clever, but it has to deal with an issue. So it's not so straightforward, because there is a, a theorem in quantum mechanics that says that you cannot clone a quantum state. So here it's easy, because we start from one, but you may start from whatever you want. 
And you cannot copy this state four times and then do the same five times because you, for, for, by the theory, this theorem of quantum mechanics, you cannot clone a quantum state. But anyway, there are ways to do it. So there are ways to correct. This is an example of a bit flip code that, okay, again, these are the CNOT gates we have just seen. So the way you imp would implement this is just by doing the CNOTs we, we just discussed. Uh, and there are codes that at the end, what they do is that they ensure that if you have a flip on one qubit, if you have encoded it on several qubits, then you can correct this. It's not as straightforward as, as, as we just saw, but, but you can do this. But at the end, the, the point is that actually, if, if you do something like this, your qubit, your logical qubit, is not anymore a single qubit, physical qubit. So your logical qubit starts to be 2, 3, 4, 5, 100 physical qubits. And this, this means, OK, if we build a large-scale quantum computer that is fault tolerant, we don't, we don't need 1 million of qubits to do the operation, that this will be 1, one, one million of qubits working as a logical qubit. But maybe we need 100 qubits per logical qubit. So at the end, the fact <laughs> there is a factor dividing the number of physical qubits you have, because your logical, your logical qubits will be made of several physical qubits. And all these quantum error correction codes, actually, in large scale, they, they do need several physical qubits in the order of hundreds or thousands of physical qubits per logical qubit. OK, so ideas for this is a bit science fiction at this point, because as I said at the beginning, we have six qubits, <laughs> six spin qubits in the best quantum processor at this point, And we're thinking about large scale. But OK, it has to be thought. So. Uh, proposals for large-scale quantum computers, they exist, and every, I would say every group has its own uh, proposal <laughs> because it's very easy to propose. But at the end, I think everyone conveys on that, on that uh, we need two D arrays. So at the end, a uh, spin a qubit quantum processor will, be based, will have two D arrays. And, uh, and we may have two D arrays on a chip here and there, and then we need a way, actually, yeah, there is a project uh, in Grenoble and ERC project working on, on these two qubit array and uh, these two D arrays. And then, then we need a way to connect these two D arrays in between them because we, they need to talk uh, between each other in a computer. You need the uh, information to go from one place to the other. So we need a way to connect these two D arrays to trans transfer quantum information. And actually, this is quite funny the way they do this. And yeah, it's a super cool experiment. The idea is to form these, these channels that, that should transmit the information between the two D arrays and using photons. So at the end, yeah, I mean, at, at the end, the, the system is hybrid and it's something like mind blowing, right? <laughs> you have quantum information encoded in spins on one of these arrays, then you couple this spin into a photon, then the photon flies to the other array and it will transmit the information to the other spin. And actually, yeah, this is, this is even in an earlier stage than the spin qubit themselves, but their experiments already in, the, in our group in Grenoble showing that it is possible to couple spins and whole spins into photons and then to, to <laughs> bring them through the channel and couple to another array, this is still to be demonstrated. But at least we are starting to couple spins to photons and yeah, these are super cool experiments. Okay, I think I, yes. Yeah, so I'm sorry, but yeah, I will skip this because I don't have time, I want if I had time to talk a bit, how do we simulate this? But maybe another time. So I will jump to, to the conclusions. So yeah, I hope uh, you, you could all follow and now you have an idea of how these semiconductor spin qubits work. And uh, yeah, usually when you see quantum algorithms and, and they, really, they, they do really scare me as well. But then you, when you understand what each of these boxes are, I mean, you, you start to see how, how this is supposed to work. And I hope, I hope you have this, this, this knowledge now. And uh, yeah, the, I also hope you, you are convinced now that semiconductor spin qubits is a promising platform. We'll see if it succeeds or not. I mean, as I said at the beginning, we don't know yet. <laughs> so we're, we, we bet for this platform, but we don't know. And we will see maybe the final quantum computer is made of something we cannot even imagine now. But this is a candidate, and it's a good candidate that has what, what, it need, what someone needs to have. Also, I, 
I, I hope you know now that quantum information is fragile and quantum computers will have errors and we need to deal with this. And also that quantum computations need to be fast because they need to happen before these quantum errors, uh, these errors occur. Also, this is a very new field. So we are at the beginning of this journey. There is a lot to be done. And from the theory side, there is also a lot to be done as well because normally the way it works is, yeah, there is an experiment. The experimentalists do the experiment. Then they check the results. They don't understand. They call, they call you and they say, can you explain me this data? And then these are the theoreticians who look at the data, propose new experiments to understand what's going on. So really, many, many experiments are driven by theoreticians. And yeah, we theoreticians, I think we have a lot to say in, in this field. And uh, yeah, with this, I will finish. I want to thank you all for you for being here and Francis for inviting me again. It's been a really pleasure. And please uh, ask me any question you have. I would be delighted to discuss with you. It's not only this is one of the points, but it's not only this. Also, I haven't mentioned this, but one one of the issues as well uh, on the loss of quantum information is hyperfine interaction. And uh, so, if we, if we talk about spin qubits and why silicon and not other platforms in spin qubits, so the semiconductor material you choose, if it, if the nuclear atoms have have a spin, this will induce a, a hyperfine interaction with your electron spin. And this is a, a source of decoherence, very important source of decoherence. Now, silicon, it only has 5%, natural silicon only has 5% of um, non-spinless atoms, which is silicon 29. And you can purify this and have pure silicon 28, which is spin-free. And this really brings you uh, much better coherence times. And actually, yeah, silicon spin qubits are, I would say, the pla yeah, among the platforms uh, with better uh, relaxation and decoherence times. In compared to, to any system. So this is also scalability is a, is a, is something good in silicon because you can benefit. And if you do quantum, uh, quantum dots based on, on transistors, putting a gate on top, and this can be fabricated on industrial fabs. The, the devices we use, they are fabricated on the same fabrication labs that they use to do classical transistors. And, and th this is great for scalability because we get these dices I showed and in these three, 300 millimeter di uh, buffers, you have millions of devices in there that are fabricated at once. And then you can test all of them. You can choose the ones that work. And if it, all the other platforms that are not working in, in silicon and they cannot do this kind of industrial fabrication, they do this uh, lab made in, in homemade devices in, in, in the lab. And in terms of scalability, this is more difficult for them. Yep. Yes, I, I did. Uh, it's on the 40 micro EB. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed that. It's okay. Uh, I think it's here. And it's important indeed. It's here. Okay. So, so, yeah, it, it's important indeed because at the end, I mean, you would like to have it as large as possible because you would have less constraints on temperature. In terms of temperature, yes, because at the end, 
if this is super small, you need to disc discriminate between these two energy states. And if you have a, a temperature that is a KT, KBT that is larger than this, you thermally populate and you cannot do quantum information anymore. So in this sense, the larger the better, but also the, the relaxation will depend on the energy splitting. So the, the, larger, the larger the energy splitting, the, the faster the relaxation. So at the end, there is a trade-off. And also in terms of, of um, technologically, you, 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 so you need to drive these and uh, the, they cannot go, I think, yeah, they cannot go far below 20 gigahertz uh, for this transition because the, the, the machines they have generating the, the oscillatory electric field that drives these cannot go generally um, above 20 gigahertz. So at the end, they are a bit limited uh, for, for the, by, by the, the technology as well. But at the end, yeah, it's on the order of, of 40, 40 micro EV. Yeah. Thanks. In, in the GitHub section of, uh, of how the qubits work, you mentioned this uh, possibility to repeat the operations several times and compare the the, mm -hmm. the output of this operation and check like, the majority. And mm -hmm. This process of deciding which one is the correct it also requires computation. This is a statistic. So is this computation done at the, at the qubit or in a regular? In, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's done on the classical world. <laughs> Indeed, indeed, indeed. So that, that yeah, yeah. The, actually, again, yeah, to the proposal, so at, the, at this point, and I think everyone that envisions a quantum computer envisions it like this, quantum computer will be coupled to a classical computer. And right now, there is a lot of classical electronics uh, on, on the quantum computers, if I can find it. Yeah. Yeah, what I wanted to show is this. So, so yeah, this, this is the proposal of a large-scale quantum computer. Actually, th these chips on the side, this is classical electronics. This is classical electronics. That at this point, it is not at millikelvin temperatures because at millikelvin temperatures you want to put the less you can <laughs> because everything heats up the system and you cannot have large powers at, at millikelvin temperatures. So normally it is above and uh, at higher temperatures or room temperature or 4K, but you have plenty of classical electronics. In, at the end, these are fridges and you have the small quantum chip at millikelvin, but then you have plenty of classical electronics around. Yeah. <laughs> I can, uh, yeah, I can give a, a hint of this, yes, indeed. So actually, as I said at the beginning, yeah, so as I said at the beginning, as theoreticians, we can both help people on characterization, people that is okay, is taking the device that has been fabricated, they rotate the spins, they try to do two qubit gates, and they analyze the signals they have. So in this, there is a lot of modeling going on on, on, on explaining the, the results, but also, on optimizing these devices, because at the end, uh, we it, it's kind of it's kind of similar to what we do on heterogeneous catalysis or on molecular chemistry or whatever. At the end, we can we can take these devices. An example: this is an example of a device we can simulate. We identify the the silicon channel, the nanowire, and the gates on top. And okay, we would form the dots below these gates. And this is a kind of device they fabricate. And we can try to simulate this by the nanowire thickness, the nanowire, um, the gate thickness, the space we put in between, and then, and then see how this affects the, the qubit properties. And then try to optimize these parameters and set uh, optimal device geometry that we can provide this, these dimensions to the, exper to the experimentalists and say, fabricate this, this will be the, the, best, the best choice. So this we do a lot, but also we help people uh, from experiments that are really doing quantum computation, trying to do quantum computation with, with these devices, and we help them explain their data. And uh, yeah, maybe just mention briefly the, okay, it is quite challenging to simulate something like this because it's huge, right? <laughs> so the, 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 the methods we use, has, 
Of course, you cannot do a Vinitio with a monster like this because you have hundreds of millions of atoms here. And even if you just take the nanowire, you have millions of atoms on this nan nanowire size. You have millions of silicon atoms. But still, you can do some semi-empirical methods. We use type binding that probably you all know. And then there is another I didn't know before. It's k.p. And uh, yeah, it's a continuum band model that at the end, it, your results are similar to, to what you get from type binding at the end. The idea is, yeah, the, the computational flow, uh, workflow we would use to simulate and the results we could get from simulations of these kind of devices is we take this guy, we build a geometry ourselves, we, we, we create a grid and we assign materials to each point on the grid and at the end it generates a geometry like this that I plot here. Then we say, okay, we compute the electrostatics of this device by solving the Poisson's equation that, okay, it's an equation that we input the potential we put on the gauge and where do we have a ground plane and the dielectric constants of all the materials and at the end it says which potential do you have on the grid at each point of the grid. And then this, this is the electrostatic so when we talked about qubits interacting and so on we showed the potential in between so you can get these things uh, from the resolution of the Poisson's equation because at the end it's just how, how the electric field evolves uh, within the material that has a given dielectric constant. So this is quite trivial to get. Then we can do the, the, the kind of, in, yeah, in comparison with, uh, with uh, surface science, what the DFT calculation would be here, it is the tight binding or K.P calculation, that at the end we do this, and we get eigen energies of the system, so the ground state, first excited state, and the, the excited state we want, and the wave function. So we can plot it as we plot molecular orbitals in molecules. Our molecular orbitals here are this kind of, of quantum dot. And we can plot this and similar to molecules. But here we don't have electron-electron uh, -electron interactions. If you have a quantum dot with only one spin, it's fine. But sometimes you have quantum dots with ampered number, but maybe this ampered number is 11 or 21 or whatever. So actually this is also quite, I, I found it quite funny. <laughs> They do CI, well, we do CI, <laughs> now I also do it. And, and, uh, and actually it is full CI, <laughs> it is full CI because, okay, we put two electrons on a quantum dot. So at the end it's two electrons, you can do full CI. So okay, we truncate the basis we use, but we do full CI, we explore the full configuration interaction space. And uh, this is by doing full CI is how we compute uh, electron electron interactions. And then on top of this, we can do dynamics and then we can simulate, okay, the spins rotating by applying, if we apply the radio frequency signal that matches the energy splitting, does the spin rotate? We solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation, we see it does. And then from here, we can try to replicate the experiments. We can try to optimize devices and this is more or less what we do. Yeah. It's a huge code house. It's 15 years old. Well, it's been evolving, but I mean, it, it was born 15 years ago and it has, yeah, it, initially it was from quantum transport and it shifted to, to quantum computing. But yeah, it's like 15 year old code. Anyone else wants to say Yeah, would you please? <laughs> yeah. So we thank again 